Thanks to HelloFresh.com for supporting PC Perspective. Receive $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code PCPER30. Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective podcast. This is episode 483 being recorded on January 17th, 2018. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Holstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malmontano. We made it through the all criti- always critical introductory switch of the cameras. Better remember our names, folks, because we're not saying them again. No, never again. <laughs> never again. No, no, I just realized we're only 17 weeks away from episode 500. Yep. Okay. 16 weeks away, I guess, technically from episode 500. Well, I'm sure we're going to plan an amazing uh, event. I don't know. Somebody can do the math, figure out where... Ep- where episode 500 will fall, what week? Do the very complicated math involved. Yeah. Of taking this week and adding <laughs> adding 16 to it. Uh, this is, for example, we are in work week three. Uh, so by my math, we add 16 to that. We're work week 19. That puts us the first week of May or second week of May for episode 500. You have I work c- weeks noted on your calendar? Yeah. Hmm. When you get important business... Business, business, one, business. One, when you get important business, business, mm-hmm. business, business, mm-hmm. one day you'll have to worry about work weeks. I see. Yeah. And when you see WW2 on a form, you'll realize they're not referring to the war that occurred in Europe. They're really, well, in Asia, they're they're talking about the second week of January <laughs> instead. Yes. Oh. So, you're, you're, so, so that's okay. not in your business yet. So that's no, not like fiscal business, business. weeks or, yeah. The Navy had some weird thing like where their weeks started and like the um, end so, of October yeah, if you're, or some silly I have worked or... with companies whose work weeks do not line up with actual weeks because their fiscal year ends in like – Yeah. I think NVIDIA's is the worst. I think their fiscal year ends yes. in like July. So it's, it's not like, even like – It's like not even – It's not it's even in the a middle. shift of three months. Yeah. yeah it's, it's really weird because I think they have quarters that end January 31st. I don't know, Josh. You might know that better than <sighs> I, but it's very confusing. No. No. Yeah. It's all wrong. Um, So welcome to the show, everyone. Uh, It is post-CES, so there's a lot to talk to. We'll run in through stuff. Um, A quick note here. uh, We record the show on Wednesday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific at pcper.com slash live. Uh, I was going to say out loud that if you're having problems doing this on YouTube, you can go to Twitch. But if you haven't found it already, that's not going to help you at all. Uh, The YouTube servers were down. So if you were looking for us live when we recorded this and you couldn't find it, um, sorry. (laughs) Uh, But twitch.tv slash PCPer is the backup you could go to for that. We're always usually streaming to both. Uh, If you need a gentle reminder about that, you can go to our subscription page. That is pcper.com slash subscribe. You get this little page here. Ask for your name and your email. We will send you a notification when we are doing a podcast recording or any other type of live stream. Uh, we don't use it for anything else, only for internal purposes, blah, 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 blah. We promise not to spam you. Uh, also, we still have our Patreon campaign running. Obviously, this is your capability, uh, your opportunity, if you will, to directly contribute to PC Per and the team and the content and the podcast and that type of stuff. Um, uh, this is It's recurring. I want to make sure some people ask for that, right? It's it's a, it's a one dollar, three dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars a month, whatever you feel like giving, uh, you can do that. Um, you can go there and see the the fancy video we made a year or so, two years ago, about why we did it. You can see a picture of Josh in a bathtub. You know, we were at, uh, we, never were at C- old. we were at CES. There was a big bathtub. There was no Josh to fill it. Was, and you know, I was sad. So was the bathtub actually there? It was there. We didn't even use it. It was actually deeper than that one. I would yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I and I and I was immediately disappointed because I showed up the day after you guys did uh, at the at the hotel. Oh, we soiled that bathtub the first. Time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was disappointed because Alan had claimed that bedroom with that bathroom, and so I never got to use it. It also had a shower it? with two shower heads, which. This, Hopefully you didn't ooh, use those. Fancy. That just you know con- it confused me more than anything else. If it confuses you, it's because I'm sorry. You know, you point <laughs> it's both. So your, it's so you shower when you're not a alone. Lot you, about you point. Alan well, sure, line. but like yeah. I, I was alone, so you like you point. <laughs> you, you, you point both. 
towards you, and now like you're used to the water yeah. coming from ahead. Stereo That's showers, from, bro. It's, I guess. it's awesome. It's All it's right. awesome. Uh, so patreon.com slash PCPer for that, as is always the case when we're doing our live streams. If you become a new patron or upgrade your patronage during the event, uh, during the live streaming, rather, I will uh, call you out uh, positively or negatively <laughs> during the show, so keep that in mind. Uh, the Patreon does enable us to do things like this, our mailbag, um, because uh, the rest of us, or most of us, were at CES. I don't say most of us, some of us were at CES. Uh, you guys get to experience 1,141 seconds of Josh Walrath, which is probably... That's my favorite song from Rent. 11,011 seconds more than he needed. But, yeah, you know... So As you can, can see I've got the the I am disappointed. That's look. that's a that's a lot of seconds. That's a lot of seconds. Um, Josh answers questions such as improving CPUs and Ryzen refresh, Spectre meltdown vulnerabilities. Will Apple ditch Intel for its own Mac CPUs? Racing games that Josh is looking forward to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I heard there was a funny steak dis discussion. A steak like is in the food? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Josh's stance on booty shaking. Maybe you want to know the answer to that. Uh, you Maybe. can find that on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash, YouTube slash PCPer, or uh, if you go to PCPer.com and look for our PCPer mailbag, uh, that would be episode 26. So, uh, hey, thanks, Josh, for handling that for us. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, really? any, uh, not any time, some of the times. Hey, you're <laughs> sometimes. welcome sometimes. Some of the time, old pal. <laughs> <laughs> Any other time, but now, actually. All right, let's get into the stuff, right? So um, Meltdown, Spectre, security crap. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Uh, it has not really died down in terms of a topic, and that's pretty much all everybody wanted to talk about when we were at CES. Uh, I walked into one particular meeting with a CPU vendor, sat down with the uh, 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 the executive representative, the PR person. They both stared at me for about 10 seconds. And they said, go ahead, ask a question. <laughs> and I was like, they were just waiting. They were like, okay. just waiting for it. I was going to do right? small talk first, but uh, clearly we have a thirty-minute window. Let's get this done. Um, so, Alan, you did some some quick testing before we left for CES about the performance impact of. I was going for meltdown, meltdown. because meltdown was supposed to be number one. Was supposed to be the the worst uh, performance impact of all three of the okay the things right supposedly supposedly um, uh, number two. Uh, the first two variants of Spectre, well, really, both variants of Spectre, mm -hmm. uh, require BIOS update and microcode uh, patches. I think the first one did not, but the second one does. I don't, it's... Well, maybe... And well, I think it, it's changing all the time. Either way, there were missing pieces yeah. to do Spectre, right. like on and off Spectre. Um, they've since some more updates have trickled out, and we're trying to line everything up to do that. Right. Um, but in the, at the time being, the quickest thing we could test was uh, test a system before it was patched for Meltdown, and then after it was patched for Meltdown. Um, and we did it on a... Now, we didn't have all the details, first of all, right? So we did it on... This was January 5th. That's when we published I did it this. on a, uh, what is that, a 7700K yep. system, right? Which is, now looking back, it's one of the newer platforms. It has different extensions that Intel had added. Uh, Ken, which platform version was that? Inve Oh, uh, that's Haswell. Haswell and up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you have if you have Haswell and up, and newer, um, your performance hit will be significantly mitigated compared to if you had prior to Haswell for your CPU. Uh, yeah. Right. The the complexities of which I don't, I'm hesitant to try to re-explain because they're very complicated. It's so it's, the, it's the, able to separate the user and the kernel. Like it's it's able to do right. But the reason it's Haswell and above is because at Haswell they introduced a feature called invalidate process CID. context ID in right. INV PCID. Right. PCID was uh, uh, introduced in Westmere, but apparently no software developers, no operating system or hypervisor vendors ever utilized it because it was incredibly difficult to use. The invalidate PCID is essentially like the inverse. So instead of naming, yep. instead of organizing all of your process context, mm -hmm. you basically say this one is not to talk to the other ones. And right. so it's it's easier to implement, right? Right. Um, and so, but now obviously OS vendors and software vendors have a reason, a very important reason to go back and introduce yeah, this. Yeah, and, there, and, and another reason they didn't want to do it initially was that there was a potential performance hit, even a yeah. small one, yeah. and people were, people were just like, 
well, screw that. I'm just not going to do that right. because I don't want to. Why would I do that? There's no security concern I'm not, here. Yeah, I'm not going to make a patch it. that's going to slow anything down, <laughs> even potentially, right? Um, so we tested uh, three different uh, possibilities as right. far as like a storage device being connected, right? We did a, a serial ATA SSD, an 850 uh, Evo, I believe, in this case, yep. right? Um, then we did a 960. Did I do a Pro for that mm. one? I forget. It was, Evo. It, was, it was before CES. 960 I Evo and forgotten then the everything. Intel Optane 900P. Okay. So we have a fast SATA SSD, a fast NVMe and NAND based SSD, and a fast, like really fast, uh, Optane SSD. Right. Right. So we got kind of the three main bases covered there as far as your, uh, you know, storage uh, performance. And I just want to see w what's going to happen. Right. So we did a round of measurements before. And then with the same conditioning in place, I was doing read only tests so that I was not disturbing the conditioning of the drives. Right. Because we're trying to measure something that's literally splitting hairs as far as performance, potentially splitting hairs, right? So it's best to just not disturb the devices between the before and after state tests. Um, end result was kind of weird and confusing and interesting all at the same time. Uh, the SATA SSD and the Optane PCIe NVMe SSD both went slightly faster. And then to throw a wrench in the works, the 960 Evo, which is the NAND NVMe, SSD yep. went slower by like 15 or 20 percent or something like that. It's, a, it's somebody in the chat asking, uh, how did you find a way to turn this into a storage topic? Uh, the, <laughs> the reason why is because the the, the first meltdown specter fix uh -huh. or the, the the vulnerability is occurs when you are. Uh, switching between user mode and kernel mode or or when uh, applications have to interface with the kernel as opposed to just their own memory space. Right. right. And and uh, I/O requests. Yeah. Yeah, storage requests specifically. Storage requests, network requests, mm -hmm. those types of things that are basically nonstop hitting the kernel saying I need this data because yep. the 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 software application doesn't get to go to the storage device directly. The kernel is responsible for doing that and returning data to the user. Yeah, so your application that's running in user land, right, requests the data. So in my case, my storage test application, right? It asks for data just the same way that any program or game or anything else would ask for data. Yeah. Does an API call says, hey, I want this storage device to give me this data. Yep. Um, well, that request is in user land. The application is in user land, right? Um, the API call goes through to the kernel. The kernel issues the IO request to the device, goes through, you know, everything else that it needs to go through as far as, you know, your IO request pipeline. The, the thing is, though, yep. that w uh, via direct memory access, which is how the IO request is completed, right, it actually interrupts the processor and says, or put, it puts the, the data where it was requested to go okay. and then says, hey, CPU, uh, there's your data, right? The issue is that potentially the data is sitting in a kernel-controlled space. Okay. Now it's got to hand it off to user land again. So potentially, the, I'm not absolutely sure of this, but potentially there's even an extra move of the data that has to happen from one space in memory mm -hmm. to even another space in memory. But at a minimum, you're forcing the CPU to toggle back and forth between user land and kernel land with data, which, okay. is, what, which is what this whole issue and patch for is supposed to right. uh, cost performance hits. You know, I, I hate to interrupt here. No, you don't. You keep saying kernel land. And I'm thinking it's like a giant KFC amusement park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the kernel. Makes me it's the kernel's land. <laughs> makes me anyway. real hungry. It's okay. the corniest place on earth. Yeah. Mm, chicken. Mm. Chicken, yeah. So, um, and they have that double chicken thing, the chicken breast with the buns as the bun. They don't sell anymore it's because the chicken it's like, as the bun. So, right, so yeah. the, the larger yes, reason. It's like 2,300 you know, calories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the larger yeah. reason we because want to Because it causes a meltdown. Dang it. Guys. Uh, so you had a good joke there, but you didn't yeah, know, him out with your The bigger reason we went straight for it was one of the first rounds of tests that were done to come out showed the worst performance hit. Uh, now, to be fair, they weren't using the same kind of storage testing we were using. Sure. They were doing... Um, it was just some benchmark that they were running. I don't remember yeah. the name of the benchmark. But there was a round of the, all these different compile time tests. And I, I'm pretty sure most it was all under Linux as well. They were using some Linux storage tool. It wasn't FIO, but it was some other, you know tool that did a bunch of file accesses or directory manipulations or something. And okay. there was a there was a big performance hit. And there were even after that, there was a string of other articles that came out. And the majority of them were all testing a 960 Pro or Evo as their device. Okay. Uh, 
so what I suspected initially, and we even had some people ask me on Twitter and whatnot, and I was like, Optane's probably going to be hit even worse. Because if this is adding enough latency for each I.O., that right. you're seeing a 20% reduction in performance on something like a 960, then that could be like several times of a reduction in performance um, for Optane because the latency is so much lower. Like you're, you yep. know, all, like one-tenth of the latency compared to a 960, right? So you'd figure if you were adding X amount of time for each request, that would hurt the Optane severely. Did the testing, that's not what happens. So well, something, there's something... Uh, that's not what happens on this platform. That's not what happens on this platform. Fair. But for the people testing it on this platform or, you know, platforms that... Uh, are somewhat mitigated for the performance that they would see from a meltdown patch. Uh, if you're testing with a 960, with or without the inbox driver, this was the inbox driver and the Samsung driver, both did the same thing, right. or at least very close. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the deal is there, but it's something with the interaction of though that set of devices that is seeing a, a bigger performance hit. This could be another change that was rolled up into that same January patch for Windows that just happens to have hit that product, that yeah. you know, product range yeah. a little bit harder. But based on what I'm seeing with the other two device types, especially Optane, I don't see why the Meltdown patch would be responsible for that change of performance right. on the drive that's I, not as fast as the Optane drive. I think what we're looking at is really... One data point, one platform right now. Well, yes. three data points, one platform. Uh, and there's a lot more still to be looked at. And to be fair, a lot of other people, like, while we were out at CS, were doing a lot of other types of benchmarking and stuff. Um, they were. A lot of it, unfortunately, and, was with 960s, though, was the thing. Yeah. And people kept seeing 15 to 20% reduction. True. It's like, yes, we're seeing that. I mean, yes, that's an unfortunate that. thing. That's a very, very popular product that they've sold millions. Oh, sure. Yeah. I just think that they... It's not unfortunate that it's that data point. It's unfortunate that it's only that data point. Right. Right? Yeah. Right. Because if you suddenly showed that, that the SATA drive was improving in performance, because now if you if you only test at 960 Pro Evo and you see a reduction, you go, oh, this is because of this. Yeah. If you see an improvement in 850 or an improvement in an Optane product, then you go, oh, I actually have no idea what's happening. Exactly. Which is where we ended up in this in this thing. Exactly. So now for now for the improvement seen on the other two, it's possible that that slight improvement is just coming from there's a little bit more work that has to be done for each I/O. The CPU has to do doesn't yeah. necessarily add latency. Right, in, in those cases, or at least not enough latency to matter and actually cause because a reduction. Because the processor is keeping up. But the processor is doing a little bit more work. And if you run a, a like low Q-depth IOPS type of test, the processor actually tries to clock down a little bit between each request. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not doing anything else. And like, you know, a few microseconds is like an eternity to a CPU when there's nothing going on in the system, right? Mm -hmm. So it starts to clock down. Then the interrupt request comes in. Now it has to spin back up. Well, if you gave it a little bit extra idle time, it potentially clocked down even to a lower power state and lower clocks, right? right? Or got a little bit deeper into that state, um, which would result in the performance being a little bit lower. I know it seems backwards, but without the patch, the performance could be a little bit lower. And then you patch it, CPU has to work harder, stays more active, responds quicker. True, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's confusing. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I, I think... Um, the only, oh, other thing, the only other thing. The, the, uh, one, the one last thing is there were a whole bunch of comments all over the place where people keep saying that, oh no, the meltdown patch is not active unless you've done the microcode or the BIOS. Right. Nothing in the white paper that I found, even on Steve Gibson's tool, he released a tool that like checks and see, you know, to see if you're patched for meltdown and mm -hmm. patched for what is it called, inspector. Mm -hmm. It's pretty. He released, um, you know, checks and it just tells Get you, it. are you patched for specter? Are you patched for meltdown? Right. Uh, even that tool, first, in its description, and you know how Steve Gibson is about researching things way exceedingly in-depth, right? So even his tool description says, all right, for Meltdown, like, it's only a OS update. Uh, for it, Meltdown, yes. It's Spectre Variant 2 yes. that definitely requires uh, a microcode addition to be uh, most secure, I guess. Now, whether or not yes. that also impacts performance more on the OS side, I don't really know. Uh, so. the, the white paper stated that that was supposed to be a very minor performance hit. The microcode itself. The microcode, like the well, what? I mean, that isn't. That doesn't seem to be the case from other, from people's testing. I understand, but those people are applying BIOS updates that might also. We've seen bigger than a twenty percent swing in QD one performance from a BIOS update, without patching security vulnerabilities. 
and perform. Yeah. Like, I, like I, if they mess I, with the the if they mess with the C state timing, the P, how the P states work, any of that stuff, it's going to drastically swing low shootout sure. performance. Um, so in that case, it's not a controlled enough environment, right? You'd, you'd really need to you'd need to have the patch applied and then use in this case now you ha now we have this inspector tool that can change the registry keys to enable and disable either patch right or at least whatever the optimizations would be for either patch yeah um i'm not sure how it can disable a microcode patch well specter isn't only a microcode patch it's I understand. an os update so if you disable yeah. one I half think of it it might not i got the impression yeah. that the be. software can do it on its own, but it can do it more efficiently if they're if the microcode update is applied. Okay, right. So so For let, let, let's leave it this. We have we have a couple more test beds we're going to do. We're going to do an Ivy Bridge based platform, which is the first, it's the only platform without with PCIe 3.0 to test storage that didn't have this INB PCID. Right. And we're also looking at a Z370 platform that has the Spectre BIOS update. Yeah. Update. Right. And then the other catch is I don't think there's gonna be a BIOS update for that earlier platform. Oh no. Asus has said X99, X299, Z170, and up. Yeah. So. So we can test meltdown. Yeah. Um, but we can't test any you know microcode or. Right. There there will be no platform that gets both a Spectre BIOS upgrade and is doesn't have INB PCID. It's just too old. Right. Like X79 is too old. Z77 is too old. You hear that, all you people out there? You're old. Oh, well. Using old hardware. And no one's using a 3770K anymore, right? It's, it's not except, one of the most popular processors ever. Except almost <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> uh, all right, let's move on to a couple of, uh, one other thing here before we jump into our ad break. Uh, Kebby Lake G officially launched at CES on January 7th. Um, this is the Intel 8th Gen CPU that includes... Radeon Vega M Graphics. This was a much rumored product yep. uh, that Intel and AMD announced their partnership about, but didn't really go into specific details on what it was. This is what that bad boy looks like. On the right in that picture uh, is the Intel processor, and on the left is the AMD GPU, and on the furthest left is the HBM2 memory. Notice a couple things. One, that GPU, much larger than the CPU. Well, I mean, it's a GPU die. Right, It's a, and it's a... Powerful GPU yeah. die. Yeah. Uh, but keep in mind that the CPU also has a GPU on it. Oh, yeah. Right? It still has Intel integrated graphics on it, which is interesting to think about. Um, you know, it, just a cool technological thing to have and to see. Um, they're still calling this the 8th generation core processor uh, H series, even though... What was the name of that substrate like the G. bus thing? That yeah. they're doing? Right? So the okay. technology here is... The, so there's a this is kind of your standard substrate across all of this. Right. This AMD section here. Oh, you can't see my cursor. I don't have that enabled. Uh, but over here on the left, between those between the GPU and the uh, uh, HBM die, HBM2 die, is where that EMIB is. Yeah. Um, in the EMIB, as he scrolls through the article, looking for um, the so that, acronym. It is embedded, embedded. multi. Die interconnect bridge. So that's just between the GPU and the memory, or is it between it's all It's only three? between the GPU and the memory. Oh. The GPU connects to the CPU through uh, PCI Express eight lanes. Only eight. Through the substrate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's just direct wired, not going to any kind Correct. of a port Correct. or anything. So yeah. this is essentially a discrete product. Yeah. And everything except the standard form factor, yeah, right? It's, just, it's, it's super tiny for a Super discrete. tiny, discrete integration. Um, it's the first 8th gen uh, Core H platform. Uh, they have some more advanced power sharing technology uh, as well. Specifications wise, it's kind of impressive. So there's two SKUs of the GPU, Vega M GH and GL. GH mm -hmm. for graphics high. Okay. And GL for graphics low. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, sure. Why We've not? seen worse lettering. We have. Yes, that's true. You can see a breakdown of the compute units and the shader counts and the clock speeds there. Clearly, the GH uh, has four more compute units, so it has uh, 240 additional stream processors. No, I'm not going to try to do the math. What is it? Four, there's 64 times these, so 256 additional stream processors. Are they going to like... Uh, higher clock speeds. 
higher, you know, 3.7 teraflops versus 2.6 teraflops. Double the ROPs, man. Uh, that's an interesting pixels. That's an interesting differentiation, is it not, Josh? Like, what what would you expect that to impact in terms of performance? It depends on the application, but it also depends on how it goes and accesses the memory. Um, because, you know, the ROPs are usually pretty closely uh, associated with the memory controller. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, usually we've when, seen you that in see, the past. You, when you see it in the past, like you have less memory if you have fewer ROPs. But in this case, you have four gigs of each. Yeah, but is it, do, they, do they say how many uh, bits of uh they what, a memory band, it's a thousand uh, thousand twenty four and they both, say that right? on both or does yeah. it say no they say okay. that on both yeah it's a thousand twenty four pretty low for hbm2 wasn't that hbm1 sort of well it's only one well it's only one, yeah, stack. It's only one stack yeah, yeah. correct yeah. so yeah. what's the yeah, power it's... consumption of this vega m thing look like well, the combined is um, so the if you look at the processor SKUs here at the bottom, right? So they're all Cabby Lake based, quad core, eight thread, uh, different clock configurations. Um, the differences are in the so yeah, okay. So uh, the 8809G, 8709G are 100 watt TDP. The 8706, 8705G are 65 watts. 8305G also 65 watts. So there's a 65 watt option, a 24 watt option. The differentiator there is primarily the graphics subsystem. Yeah. Right. So the GL is in the 65 the watt parts. Vega. That's right. That's right. Now, what's interesting here is that pretty much as as you see, we'll talk about those, these products on the on the left on the rundown. Um, the notebooks are using the 65 watt part. And the Nook is using the 100 watt part, and that's the only really system we've seen um, offering the 100 watt version. I mean, that makes sense. You kind of want it to be plugged I mean, in. I mean, kind of. It's interesting, right? Because um, you know, <clears throat> you get these. 65 is already kind of high for a mobile platform. But there are notebooks that dissipate 100 right. watts of heat. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's CPU and GPU. Sure. For like, like if you look at a a, a, a GTX 1060 or 1070 Max Q design, that's over that's like 100, 100 watts. Okay. Right. Um, because you're combining an H series processor that's 30, 35, 45 on its own, plus yep. whatever the GPU is going to pull. Now you're doing it in a much denser space, which is both advantageous for board design and in implementation, but also disadvantageous for, for trying to cool it. thermals, right? Yeah. Like trying to get it cooled. But is it though? I mean, you can Not still... necessarily. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're using heat pipes and stuff, like you can yeah, move you 100 watts. Well, it, you could simplify cooling significantly yet still expand on you the have amount to have, of, of potential cooling there is. Don't you so have to have... instead of having a cooling system for your GPU yeah. that has to handle up to 75 to 100 watts and a separate cooling system for your CPU that's, what, 25 to 35 watts, you can combine that entire space and fin process a lot more effectively and for a 100-watt part, and, and you may still get better peak performance um, with a lower TDP because it's not try to juggle all the thermals as much. And I, plus, I, I guess the um, the power, um, we haven't learned enough about this, but I've heard the power sharing with that is truly impressive. Um, that's what, how it can that's shunt what, it back and forth. Intel would like to tell us that, and and I have no reason to not believe them. But yeah, they, they call it dynamic power sharing, and it's supposed to be um, more advanced than any kind of CPU with discrete GPU has ever been before. Um, you know, the, Intel's claim is that they put this the the semi custom part of the GPU that they got from AMD on this uh, is that they had these hooks put in so that they could uh, control in hardware and software the 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 power of the GPU itself and of the memory itself, right? So um, the goal is to, <clears throat> as this slide shows, is not necessarily lower power, but more efficiency for that power. How many frames? per second per watt do you mm -hmm. get how many frames per watt are you able to get and they're showing you know a, a 20 percent improvement in efficiency frames per watt compared to something that does not integrate this dynamic power saving uh or dynamic power sharing technology um and then this thing could conceivably like for short periods probably draw more than 100 total right um because intel cpus will do that I mean, in in theory, yes, but also the the number of instances where 
any kind of gaming or graphics thing, you would want to have a, you would have a sudden spike that wouldn't be more sustained right. is lower. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Usually, it's continuous for those. Yeah. And well, we'll look. We'll finish through here. So if you look at like some of the graphics and some of the benchmarks they're showing, um, this graphic is comparing it to three year old PC. So take that for what you will. Um, this one here is comparing it to uh, GTX 1050. So a similar, like it's the same CPU with a new GPU, you're getting anywhere from 1.1 to 1.4x better performance than a GTX 1050. And this is with the Vega MGL. Hmm. And for the Vega MGH, they're comparing it to a, uh, that's a three-year-old machine. So again, yeah, skip that one, go to the next one. Uh, Vega MGH is 1.13x or so, you know, anywhere. It, it's basically matching to 10, 10, 15% faster than a GTX 1060 Max-Q implementation. So, you know, <clears throat> which is good. This is not, it's amazing actually. Yeah. Um, but what's important to note is it's not um, fundamentally new levels of performance. It is something that we have seen before that exists, but sure. it has never existed in this package mm -hmm. before. And it's never existed as a, as a product from Intel. Even though this uses Radeon graphics, you know, that they buy from AMD and implement themselves, this is sold by Intel, supported by Intel. Um, the driver support comes from Intel, which is, you know, an it's interesting discussion to have, right? There, it's it's hard to see in that slide. It's also slide. going to be cheaper, or in theory, it should be cheaper well, than a combination the, Intel, you know, CPU with a 1060Q. You would think card. they would use that capability on their side as well, right? In theory, they could charge the same or more and say, "Hey, you're going to get this advantage in board space. You get this advantage to make thinner designs and improve more battery. We think our our advantage is worth it." Um, I would like to believe that they would say, "We're going to be a little bit cheaper than this." I don't know what that structure is, and in reality, whatever you look up on Intel's Arc website means literally nothing when it comes to notebook um, product pricing. Because all the deals they make with Dell and HP and Lenovo and, and what have you, MSI, have nothing to do with what is shown on those particular websites. Um, the software side is interesting, right? Because uh, Intel has gotten a lot of crap over the years, and I think deservedly so, for having very poor graphics drivers support, especially for gaming. Right Now you're introducing a Radeon Vega GPU on there that um, has the potential to be very important. Oh, I don't want that update. Thank you. Uh, very important uh, for 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 gamers, and now you're putting a lot of confidence in them because you want to game on this thing. And, and the, basically, the the business deal they have with AMD is they're gonna they're going to rebrand. They're going to I don't want to say rebrand. They're going to get the core driver from from AMD's Radeon team. Yeah. Repackage it in a, in the in the, the the software that looks just like the Radeon uh, control panel. Uh, okay. Uh, what do they call Except it? Except blue. Except it's blue instead of red and has an Intel logo instead of Radeon AMD logo. Settings. Radeon settings. Which kind of blows my mind, right? The idea that there's this like essentially rebranded software package that instead of having an AMD with red coloring, it's Intel with blue coloring. It's like one step away from Intel acquires AMD. Yeah, or, it's it's you know. it's kind of weird. But now they're responsible for those drivers out. And so, you know, I've talked with them and they've 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 assured me that, oh, you know, when Radeon has a day one driver, we're going to have a day one driver. That's surprising because I was totally expecting like this whole, you know, cell phone OS update through the vendor crap that happens to everybody. Like, I mean, that that's still you know a question I mean? because in, Intel has not previously, you know, forced OEMs to use their drivers like NVIDIA has done. NVIDIA has done a very good yeah. job of, of strong arming uh. these guys and saying, you're going to let us use People can download GeForce drivers from GeForce.com. Is that not the case, Ken? I'm pretty sure that's the case with Intel Integrated Graphics. Like, I don't think that HP has their own version, their own builds or anything. I'm pretty sure. Oh, it's really? Universal okay. At this point. All right, yeah. maybe that's Could the case. And, that, and back but... in the day, Nvidia had that issue on. Mobile. They did, but it's been it's been several years since that was yeah. a problem. Yeah, it's not a thing anymore. Um, yeah, but it, Dell is the same as HP. If you go and you look, you will find a driver that will be four or five years old. Yeah. For like an HD 4000. Got it. But you can still you download go with the, the Windows one. It's newer. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, this is the new logo. So this is the branding that's going to be on these notebooks. Notice it does not say AMD anywhere. It is Intel Core i7 8th Gen Radeon RX Vega M. Huh. Uh, With mad eyebrows. Like, yeah. They're just black instead <laughs> it's a, of red. It's a really interesting product, um, which now we will discuss in its implementation form. 
Oh. Let's talk about the Cabby Lake G Nook. So this is the one that's using uh, the 100 watt version. It's the only product we know of today that is utilizing the 100 watt version of this part. What, what prior Nook had a discrete GPU? Uh, I don't think a Nook did. There were Nook knockoffs like from bricks. like like Gigabyte, yeah, yeah, but not bricks. those. I'm talking just a Nook. The, there was a Skull Trail Nook that was a similar design, thinner, lighter. Yeah. Um, it wasn't what like part usual was it? brick. It was it a it didn't have a discrete GPU in it. No, it had an Iris Pro GPU. It had an Iris yeah. Pro. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So still not discrete. No. no. They've never done a nook with a discrete GPU in yeah. it. Yeah. Well, thanks to this tiny So I mean it, it's it's bigger than like we don't have any comparison photos in here. Well, there you go. You can get smaller a little bit of idea. Than a bread box. It is definitely smaller than a bread box. Get an impression uh, there from the amount of connections that are on looks it. It's a little big bigger than the skull trail one. It yes. is. Yeah. It's thicker. It's 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 a bigger oh. in general. Looks about the size of a uh, cable modem. Yeah, smaller than that, I'd say. Well, yeah. Yeah. no, like a yeah. it's close. It's, it's, like, it's, it's it's less thick than that. It's a bigger footprint, but okay. yeah. Um, they're calling it the uh, Nook Eight Enthusiasts, which I must immensely <laughs> and immediately compliment the naming scheme. Compared to previous, Some of the previous iterations, yeah. <laughs> oh, don't worry, it's still the Nook 8 i7 HVK. Oh no, you're right. And the well, HNK. okay, oh, no. but it has a shorter name. They yeah. couldn't bury that name too deep. That's true. They have 100 watt and 65 watt versions of it. Uh, it's going to be 9.99 bare bones for the high end nice. version. Wow. 7.99 bare bones for the 65 watt version. Uh, comes with wireless connectivity, but you got to add. You basically add storage and memory. Yeah. Right. Hey, you got you go. Thunderbolt three. Yep. There's there's actually a lot of stuff on here, right? Like you get two uh, gigabit Ethernet, you get Thunderbolt, you get Display Port, you get four USB three point uh, three point one three point oh. This would make the best PS Sense box. <laughs> be a bit of a kill. <laughs> it's got an SD card reader on the front. You got HDMI in the back, HDMI in the front. There's actually a lot here. Um, six display outputs, I believe. Yeah, six total display outputs. Um, March 2018 availability. It's an impressive device. It is expensive. There's no getting around that. Like a thousand bucks plus memory plus storage. You're looking at, let's say, you add a, a 500 gig 960 Evo or something like that. What's that going to cost you? Three hundred dollars. So, uh, and then what's memory? Another three hundred at this point because <laughs> f everything. So you're talking about fifteen to sixteen hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. For this rig, which is essentially a high end. Gaming laptop without a monitor, without a display a keyboard. or keyboard or touchpad, touchpad. or that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah, but you also have to use a laptop, keyboard, or touchpad. <laughs> that's true. You're not you're not relegated to that. Yeah, I would yeah. agree. It's true. Um, so I think that's actually a really interesting product. It'd I'm be, excited to get hands on with it. It'd be one badass thing to hook up to your TV. I know we always say that about Nooks, like oh, you could hook it up to your TV, but like you could actually play this one some, can actually game. You could actually play some games at 1080p yeah. on this thing. Yeah, you still have that whole. And that's why I told them. I said. Like there's no there's no good 10 foot interface for Windows still. It still sucks as a device connected to a TV that you don't have a keyboard and mouse for. Um, but I don't really expect Intel to fix that. That's not necessarily but, their but problem. Can you hook it to the Nvidia TV? No. Uh, yeah, you can. Maybe. Sure. Why not? It's gonna have HD. Well, you don't just call it TV. On? No. Does this? No. It has. It will support free sync. No, 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 no. Does the BF uh, the, the that, Nvidia you're, TV? You're does that? Ahead. That's G-Sync, yeah, right? You're, you're skip. You're skipping ahead, man. I don't know what you're talking Come on, about. Can't you see the rundown? Nope. Nope, me neither. Uh, so that's that's a Cabby Lake G Nook. And then also we have um, Cabby Lake G Notebooks that we got hands-on with. We got to see the 8th gen, the HP Spectre X360 15, uh, which is a convertible, you know, yoga style. Um, it is available both with uh, uh, Cabby Lake G and Cabby Lake R Plus MX150 which will be an interesting kind of side-by-side -side comparison if we can get a couple of those devices in. In terms of pricing, the Cabby Lake G model is uh, uh, for, starting at $1449 with the 256-gig SSD and um, 8 gigs of RAM. If you want the real version, it's $1699 with 16 gigs of RAM and a 512-gig SSD. Looks very much like the Spectres we have seen before. Wait, uh, scroll up. Yep, okay. You were looking at the MX150. Oh, sorry, no, I was looking at the wrong. The yeah. Like refresh. My bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think anything particularly stood out about it other than it's a 15 inch convertible that has pretty impressive graphical capability. And then also we had the Dell XPS 15 2 in 1, um, also powered by Cabby Lake G. What's interesting here is I'm pretty sure, I don't, I feel like I was corrected on this, but I don't think it's right that this was 
actually a 65 watt part, but are they actually 45 watt TDP it, down? It's a 65. It's a 65 watt part yep. being configured to use about 45 watts average. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be lower performance than the metrics that Intel was claiming in their 65 watt part. You know, we'll have to wait to get hands on with one of these to do some testing. Uh, it's a really nice design, though. Um, you know, it's a 15 watt machine, so it's not small, it's not light. It's um, an inch, not 15 watt. Well, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's definitely not a 15 watt machine. Um, 15 inch screen, so depending on what your preferences are for notebooks at this point, you know, uh, but it is it is an impressive piece of hardware. The, the screen is 100% Adobe RGB, so it's like it's a really nice screen as yeah. well, which is which is cool. One of the things that I was asking a lot of people about is neither of the machines that were shown as Cavi Lake G products by Intel had any inkling of branding or even promotion towards gaming devices. Like this is not nobody ever said, oh, this is a great portable gaming device. Hmm. Um, and when I talked with Dell about it. They were very kind of uh, – they messaged it as this is a gaming – this is a device that can game, but not necessarily one that is, like, targeted towards gaming, which I think undersells the, the capabilities of the part quite a bit, right? You know, I, I understand targeting as, a, as a kind of like a mainstream workstation. You're doing video editing. You're doing content creation, something like that. That GPU is going to help with that. Uh, but really, I think – you know, more so than any any other product that Intel's put out, this is really targeted at that gaming audience. So I don't know if there's just like a time delay between, you know, like HP and Dell got first dibs on this before MSI Asus get to do something with it, or if MSI and Asus are too much beholden to NVIDIA on their discrete parts to really do anything with it, or, well, or what? I mean, Dell's kind of taking a similar approach on the, on the XPS 15 which in the last generation, I guess it's technically still the current generation, they have 1060s in them. Yeah. So or 1050 Ti's, 1060s maybe, I can't remember exactly the sure. configurations, but they don't advertise it as a gaming product at, in the least. Yeah. It's just not, like, they have a gaming brand, mm. and it's Alienware. XPS is not that. So we'll, we'll be following up on that soon. I think we should actually have some hardware for all of these devices uh, relatively soon. Before we get into our ad for the week, quickly say uh, thanks to hmm, Kundrapu Naveen Keshav Rao pledged three dollars. Let's see how badly I, I massacred that name, but thank you very much. And then uh, Heidi Bird edited their pledge from one dollar to three dollars. So thank you guys both very much for your support. patreoncom perp Now let's quickly get to uh, our sponsor for today's episode. That would be uh, our friends over at HelloFresh. They're offering everyone in our audience $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code PCPER30. Pretty straightforward, guys. Um, this is a, a meal delivery service that sends you ingredients pre-packaged, pre-sized, uh, pre ready to go, so you're, you're still getting the, the home-cooked meal without having to go uh, shopping, without having to go uh, buy any of the, uh, um, the, the, the products that go bad. You don't have to go buy cheese because they couldn't ship you cheese. Everything comes in in uh, refrigerated kind of uh, packages with ice, ice bags in them. Uh, it's, it's super convenient. It's actually really fun, um, and I, I think it's, actually, it's a pretty good value when it comes right down to it as well. Uh, for convenience, right, you can choose your delivery day that works for you. Uh, you can pause it for weeks when you're out of town. Really helpful for somebody like me who's doing some traveling uh, quite a bit. They have a pretty big selection of flexibility, right? They offer a wide variety of chef-curated recipes that change weekly. They have three plans. You can choose classic, veggie, and family, right? Obviously, vegetarian, family, if you want to have something that is more kid-friendly uh, than, than some other options, Um I actually, right before we came over here to record the podcast, uh, cooked up one of the ones that they sent over. It was a uh, flatbread pizza with zucchini and chicken sausage, and it was really good. And I'm not very good at cooking, and the step-by-step -step directions, um, the, the kind of pre-portioned ingredients make it all really easy to handle. Um, and... I got to stay home. You know, we didn't have to go out. Somebody didn't have to go to the store and run errands to pick something up. I didn't have to ask my wife to pick up cruddy fast food on the way home from work or anything. Why are you laughing at that, Alan? It sounds like something you do too often. Because you ate McDonald's <laughs> twice today. Yeah, see, it's not good for you. It's not good for you. Um, you don't have to spend all night in the kitchen either because these recipes are generally targeted at like 30 minutes or so. Uh, and I think usually they have one that's faster than that. 
each week as well. Uh, and I, I think, and Ken will agree with this because I know he's used this too, the, you, you gain confidence as you do this just in like how to get around the kitchen, using pots and pans and, and cooking, and, and they teach you, they kind of walk you through these techniques or they instruct you in these techniques and you Google a little bit, what does it mean to you know, dice versus chop, and you go, oh, okay, now I'm learning. And, and now you can apply that for other things, right, when you don't have a HelloFresh meal for that particular day. But why would you do such a thing? One of the great things is also that the, at least there are usually a couple of items that are more exotic than something you would normally think to cook for yourself. So like, I mean, we live in the Midwest, it's pretty meat and potatoes. You're not cooking yeah. Asian inspired dishes a lot, but you learn how to use those flavors and you learn how to cook those dishes that you can incorporate into other things. And it's just a great experience. The two meals I've had, so like the zucchini chicken sausage pizza, I would never have made on my own. And then uh, the one, there's one left that I'm looking forward to that I was kind of, I was sad that my wife uh, suggested the other one first, was like a, uh, a cauliflower, uh, this is a cauliflower inspired dish. Like it was, it's a vegetarian thing, but it sounded amazing uh, with it. And it's like, I would never have thought to cook hmm. in that particular way. So um, it, it, it's really great, guys. I would encourage everybody to try it out, honestly. If you go to HelloFresh.com, use the code PCPER30, you get $30 off your first week of deliveries. Uh, and I honestly think it's it's worth a shot. Again, thank you to HelloFresh.com for sponsoring us. HelloFresh.com, promo code PC, PCPER30 for $30 off. And we thank them for their support of this uh, awe-inspiring show of wit and technology and information. Josh, you're supposed to say something witty there. Witty. All like right. to eat. <laughs> yeah. Let's run through uh, the CES stuff. We're running late as it is. Ryzen APU announced coming February 12th. Josh, any thoughts on this? This is Ryzen CPU, Radeon Vega graphics. Go. Go. You forgot to wind Josh. up. Go. I think he's gone. I, I'm not gone. I just was muted because I was <laughs> coughing. Oh. It's about damn time. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. We've had excavator based cores for what the past three years. People have been expecting. I mean, we've had it, it, it's gone over to AM4, but only 4 OEM. I mean, you can kind of pick it up if you look on the gray market, but there hasn't been anything like this from AMD, and they needed it badly and then they needed it this year but they couldn't do it and i understand why now it's it's going to be really interesting because they have redone some stuff in there this is kind of the first time that we're going to see the infinity fabric working with gpu and cpu we've we've talked about you know the cpu infinity fa fabric working with the memory controllers and the cross ccix uh, communications and uh the cache memory and all that stuff. But now we finally get to see this running with a GPU and this infinity fabric took up, I think quite a bit of design time to get it implemented on the GPU side. And it's not only for the CPU, I mean, not only for the standalone graphics, but I mean, really was aimed at this. This is where they think that it will really be great for power and performance and just the granularity of of memory accesses, um, power sharing, all of these things that, that we kind of expect in a next generation APU. It looks like it's going to be showing up here. Um, they've improved apparently um, latencies internally for caches and memory accesses mm -hmm. as compared to Ryzen. Uh, you know, the initial Ryzen. So it's it's a slightly redesigned core, but it's not anything, you know, amazing. I mean, maybe right. we'll see 2 to 5%, depending on some some corner cases. Um, I that font. They've nice. probably worked on power <laughs> extensively. This is still a 14 nanometer part. It will be moving to 12 nanometer sometime, I think, next year. But uh, it's it's... AMD needed this, and they needed it badly, and think, this was only going to help them out. I think this this slide here really shows it uh, in that it's not something that enthusiasts really think about very often because, hey, a Ryzen processor, I'm going to use a discrete GPU, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But for you know half of the market, essentially, they just use the integrated graphics on an Intel part. Sure. And the Ryzen parts were fundamentally disadvantaged by requiring somebody to buy, even if it's a 30 or 50 or an $80 
GPU um, still an added to cost, do that. It's yeah. still added power draw. And and AMD still kind added of driver conflicts. Yeah. Still all sorts of fun. Yeah. And and AMD was kind of missing out on one of the f you know tent pole capabilities that it has in its graphics IP. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think they ha they'll have they'll have more complexity trying to convince people that the advanced graphics in a Ryzen APU. I, and I want to be clear. I don't think AMD is calling these APUs anymore. Um, but it, 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 imploring people that the Ryzen with Vega graphics is valuable compared to the Intel integrated graphics. Um, but I think I think they're making the case there. So these will be out February 12th. So we're looking forward to testing them. Hopefully with uh, whoever Unlock Ed is um, on the overclocking side too. But hey, Ken, can you show that slide? That comment makes a lot more sense if I show that slide. I don't. I don't know what you mean. Unlock Ed. Unlock Ed. When you send out Unlock Ed presentations, it's free have, Ed. The PDF we'll should have wake the right font. Then. <laughs> uh, let's on, see what else guys. we got. Speaking of Ryzen, the second gen Ryzen CPUs are confirmed to be coming in April of this year. Um, these are the 12 nanometer Zen Plus processors, not Zen 2 architecture, Zen Plus. So these are, you know, slightly higher clocks, uh, improved precision boost technology. They're calling it Precision Boost 2. If you remember back when Ryzen first launched, they admitted that they didn't have the time that they really needed to make Precision Boost a, a good implementation in its first run. It was very um, coarse in how it did things. Uh, and that's going to change with, uh, with the second generation parts. Also worth noting in this roadmap, let me click on this and, and show it here. Um, so they have Q1 for the desktop APU. Oh, I can't slide over enough. Gen 2 uh, rising there. And this box is being cut off on my screen. I don't know if I can. Let me see if Just I can. Just zoom uh, out and see if you can. No, it's keeping it to the right. So mm. that's all right. Uh, hiding the Threadripper. It basically converts, uh, says that in second half, you'll have Threadripper second generation as well so i think that will that will interest some people same socket am4 right so all of your existing x370 motherboards will support these and 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 b350 is that right yeah uh boards will support these processors however comma they are going to have an x470 chipset with new motherboards based on it it just will not be required. They claim that it's going to be optimized for these GPUs. I'm sorry, for these CPUs. Uh, lower power, launching the same time frame. Essentially, if you remember all kind of like the, the power hiccups that they had and kind of working with these motherboard guys for the first time again in a very long time, yeah. um, they're correcting that here. So, is, so that, is that platform supposed to also add something that might make that compatible with you know, CPUs from further down the line that wouldn't be compatible with like I the 350? I don't believe that's the case. I, okay. I, I, I don't think so. I don't know that, but I don't believe that's the case. I think they have, you know, promised AM4 compatibility for some time. Okay. Right? Um, but at this point, compared to Intel, even going to the second generation is a freaking yeah. amazing yeah. Uh, uh, a fa uh, feat. capability. Yeah, feat. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, to do. So there's not a lot of other information on this. Um other than kind of an April time frame. So now we know, uh, which probably has something to do with these price drops then. Oh, gee, as well. Look at those. Not a quinky dink, probably. That uh, at the same time they announce that the next generation is going to come. And I, w I, w I will say, like, in, uh, AMD did tell us the second gen, you're looking at maybe 10% better performance at each class segment. That yeah. includes higher clocks. And any other the precision boost changes. Yeah, they're just optimizing a little right? bit. So Nothing crazy. Not, not, a, not nearly, you know, people who thought, oh, my God, we had a 52% IPC improvement <laughs> uh, from, you know, the, the previous gen to the first Ryzen part. You're not going to get that here. Nope. Now, what, what you get out of Zen 2 may be something different, but we'll talk about that in 2019. Um, <laughs> the, the, so the Ryzen price drops are interesting. Jim put this table together, I think, was really useful. Um, the... Biggest and chances are you've seen these price drops kind of hit or miss, like on Amazon and Newegg throughout the last quarter. They've kind of been like A B testing stuff. So the Ryzen 7 1800X launched at 499, now is dropping to 349. So mm -hmm. a 30% drop in that in that uh, a CPU price. The 1700X goes from 399 to 309. Um, 1700 is going down 30 bucks. Um, the 1600X going down 30 bucks. So anywhere from you know seven to 12 to 30% difference. The only Threadripper that drops in price is the 1900X 
goes from 549 to 449. It's um, a nice drop on the 1700X and the 1800X, though. Yeah, the 1800X especially. Um, I still think the 1700 is probably the sweet spot for people who are building it is, these machines. Well, it's dropping from 400 to almost 300 the, the bucks. The 1700X is the sweet spot. Yeah. You think the only, is? It, it's only 10 bucks more than the 1700. Yep. Now, yes. Okay, yeah. So, you're right, I mean, you're right, you're right. You, well, because it used know, to be 70. I got to throw in here because uh, if you go on Amazon or Newegg, Threadripper 1950 is 899. Correct. But that is not that is a quote unquote sale and not a price reduction. Yeah. Right? So what it doesn't it's mean anything it doesn't mean anything to the consumers. Yeah. Well, actually, the 1950X was for sale for 799 for a yeah. few weeks as That's well. That's true. Yeah. Mostly so, over Black Friday Christmas time period. It was like yep. it was like two or three weeks straight that it was yeah. 799. Um so, yes, you're right. You can still find these parts cheaper than this. These are just the SEPs. These are the MSRPs, whatever you want to call it, um, that, are, that are bringing these down. They're not going to be more expensive than this unless someone develops some sort of Ryzen-specific cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shut up, Ken. Um, They'll hear you. Coin. This probably has something to do... Nice. This probably has something to do with the... April release of the new processors. You want to make sure you don't have too much inventory uh, of, of uh, these old ones as they come out. Um, they're still, you know, fantastic parts. Also, you know, somebody was asking them, like, you know, are you having trouble? Do you only lower prices when you're having trouble selling something? And he's like, no, we're not having trouble selling any of it. And apparently they just said, like, when they did this A-B spot testing, when they dropped that part to 349, they sold more they sold enough more to make up for the difference, so yep. they made it up in volume. Got to make that will. supply and demand curve. You got to find that sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Always make it up. Always make it up in volume. And then the final thing from AMD at CES, which is still a lot, uh, they teased barely teased seven nanometer Vega. So uh, this is coming sampling in 2018. No official word on when they're actually going to release this. It is not a gaming part; it is a machine learning optimized part, um, which will make all the gamers upset and angry because we, now we have – we literally have no more information about Vega. Uh, when the hell did that launch? June? No. Vega? Vega 64. Vega? Like October? July? Mm, no, later well, than that. Yeah, it was like one, a special creator's edition or whatever the hell they call it. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to remember I think we were Sig talking when about was it in July. Was 2017 was a blur. Siggraph November? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Siggraph was August. November. August. No, it was way sooner than November. August, I think, was the frontier. Oh, but at SIGGRAPH is when they did the R, uh, Radeon RX, the, Vig, the the Radeon, like the gaming one. Yeah. So I think that was later than that. Regardless, um, we know nothing else about this other than it's a 7 nanometer part. It's focused on machine learning. They, they have a line in there about new DL ops, new deep learning operations, uh, but they didn't go any more... Uh, detail than that. It could mean that they're going to integrate something similar to what NVIDIA has done with um, Volta, where they integrated tensor core style, like tensor cores on that GPU. AMD maybe decided to do something like that or similar um, in order to to keep up in that space. Um, they were integrated new I.O. You know, to compete with NVLink. Uh, and they have MX GPU support for dividing those resources for virtualization as well. And you can see here, this is like their roadmap, right? Now, I use that term in virtual air quotes <laughs> because it has 2017 on one side, it has 2020 on the it's other. It's not a very good map. Yeah, and it's just got code names and, you know, process it's like nodes. like Lisa Sue just pointing somewhere. It, it's like you have no idea what 2019 or one, maybe all three of these last parts are 2020, right? And they just have a, a subtitle that says not to scale on here or something. <laughs> um, but what, what, what might concern you is that if Vega 7 nanometer is listed as sampling in 2018 and Navi is now listed as 7 nanometer and it's after that. Do we now go all the way back to sampling in 2019 for that? Is this a tw is is mm. now Navi definitely a 2019 part based on this what you're seeing, Josh? What do you think? Is that likely? Potentially, kind of seems like uh, this Vega Seven nanometer is is a pipe cleaner, and possibly seven, six, seven months after that, we'll see. Uh, Navi sampling and uh, being introduced in the second half. I yeah. mean, this is—it could be either or, just because 
we don't know how far behind and plus seven nanometers a pretty big jump for everybody I it mean, is tsmc's kind of got it running but we don't know That's how well true. it's going to be they've done that in the past with uh, gosh like uh 130 nanometer down to 110 or somebody like that i can't remember they but they did a part um that kind of showed them how to get it going yeah and then they released just a couple of months after that their next generation stuff so right. they could be doing that that would probably make the most sense uh, especially given how much uh, r&d funds the graphics guys are uh, being given as compared to the cpu guys yep yep so we'll see again not a lot of great information a lot of detailed information on that side but you know do we can. Uh, NVIDIA's biggest announcement on the gaming side, you know, they talked a lot about their autonomous driving stuff, uh, having a two-year advantage and that stuff, but they have this thing called the BFGD, which obviously stands for Big Format Gaming Display. Mm, you might yeah, also call yeah. it the Big F and Gaming Display. Mm, big F and G-Sync Display. Uh, this is a 65-inch G-Sync television, no. essentially. No, it's not. I'm still saying that. It's, nope. They call it a display. They don't even call it a monitor. Exactly. Yeah. BFGM wouldn't be as cool, but BFGD, <laughs> it's essentially a 65-inch monitor, 4K, 120 hertz, HDR, HDR10, right? Yes. Um, that has an NVIDIA shield integrated into it. Air quotes. Well, I mean, it I is mean... physically integrated <laughs> into it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um. It's a really interesting idea um, that looked cool. Like, so it was still in early prototype stages. Like, the final builds weren't weren't great. Um, there were some issues with the backlighting that we saw that needed to be worked out. Uh, but the idea is, hey, you know how since G Sync came out, we all wanted TVs with it. That never happened. How about we do it ourselves, right? And that's essentially what the BFGD is. Yeah. They're working with Asus, Acer, and HP. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. On this, um, we're not sure what the inputs will be, right? Correct. And I think it will differ based on the vendor. Um, like the implementations, when I peeked behind the BFGD and looked at it, like literally there is a housing uh, around everything, like a back, right? And then there's an there's a suspicious HDMI cable of about yay long, you know, foot. Like long Not that even. goes out of a port and into a port which yeah. is very clearly and it's coming from a, th a, a the bulge shield. it's a shield shaped bulge <laughs> in the back of uh, the housing and into <laughs> what looks like an input on the tv yeah right which is actually interesting in a couple of reasons one it tell and, and because nvidia confirmed that g-sync would work on the shield tv so variable refresh would work on the on the shield tv right so if you have Media playing at 23.97 FPS, it's mm -hmm. going to play back on the screen at that frame rate. Yep. Um, the games would do that. Android games would do that. And if you're streaming stuff through, like, game stream from your desktop PC somewhere else, you stream it to the BFGD as it's, as the Shield itself, the Shield TV, um, that it would support VRR there as well. Telling me that that HDMI port is supporting G-Sync, mm -hmm. which is something that no desktop monitor has ever done. Right. There's no HDMI G-Sync support that exists in the ecosystem. That's true. Today, so interesting to note that and kind of see. There's an awful lot of people that, that have wished that there were displays that would go both ways. Heh. That like we're like, well, why yeah. won't this just work? And now they're going to have this potentially working with G-Sync over HDMI. Yeah. You're yeah. Right. So that'll be a headache for Nvidia. Yeah. In some, yeah. In some form. This is a a late summer, early fall product. Mm -hmm. Right, so they have some time to figure out what all that stuff is going to be. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's a small market for this, right? Because you have to have, you can't be as close as you are to your standard computer monitor more than likely and use this device. Mm -hmm. Maybe for gaming, if if you want to have this idea of like being completely surrounded and engulfed in this vision. Uh, however, like if you stop gaming and want to browse the internet. That's, oh not, God. that's not very effective. Uh, so you're going to have to be further away from it. So it's more of a TV style. I think they, yeah, they called it be... like for people who have a gaming cave in their house type of thing. Like that's the setup mm -hmm. where you have the flexibility to have a TV a little bit further away uh, and then a separate like, you know, desk area, maybe a hospital TV tray, whatever it happens to be for your keyboard and mouse 
on it. Um, no idea on pricing. They wouldn't talk anything about that. They said, well, 65-inch HDR TVs exist. Right. And we'd be, it'd be weird if we were a lot more expensive than those. Was essentially the direction we got. Are there actually 4K true 120 hertz not TVs? 100, not, not really 120 not hertz. Really, because they don't like they don't put Display Ports on TVs and HDMI. Yeah, you can't you can't yet. get a 120 hertz signal into them. Yeah, so oh, the panels oh, right. yeah. can run native on some of these they, TVs. Did they tell natively. us officially about color spaces and stuff or what? They just say it is in the P. Th- it conforms to P3. They did not tell us what. Percentage. So yeah. What about the uh, four two two? Oh yeah, they did say four two two at one hundred forty four hertz. One hundred twenty, you mean? Oh, okay. It, might, it could have been. Yeah. It could have been one forty four. I think it's one forty four. Okay. Did scroll, they ever say to did the they, top of Did they say four 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 at anything? That they only. Well, it's uh, it's one hundred twenty. So you're right. They think they only said four two zero. Four two zero. Or okay. Yeah, I think you're I, right. I, I, I don't think, remember I think enough. I think that's what you're. You you I don't probably, remember enough to say it. So you could probably hit 444 at um, 60 at 4K 60. Yeah, probably. That's okay. what I would expect. Is that you're losing the? Additional. The only other is issue it, I saw with the with the display was that uh, when you have what do you call it when you have a segmented backlight? Um, Full array. Uh, that's local dimming. Local well, segmented how? Like like local dimming. Yeah. Right, but you don't know. We didn't know. I asked them like how many segments are we broken into, and they said, "Oh, we're not talking about that yet." But you could see the zones. So, like the problem was, they were using a black desktop background, oh. and then when you had this white mouse cursor, yeah, move across the screen, you got you the, have this glow kind of around it. You got the original Star Wars effect. Yeah, yeah, more or less. Well, I mean, it was it was like you know, if the cursor was the size of your thumb, you had this shape about the size of a of a of a cantaloupe kind of following around it that was just slightly brighter than everything else around it. Yeah. And it stood out, right? And they were trying to hide it. You know, like there was a TV off to the side that had a cursor up and in the corner. And, that, and that's just and that the, eliminated the corner. That's just that the contrast ratio of their screen that they're using is not that great. Right, if the backlight right. is bleeding through the black, so I mean, it's, it's noticeable. Backlight stuff is stuff you can change later in the Again, game. It's still, like, yes, I, it is I still don't early. expect it to ever ship like that, to be honest. I, it would be, no, they couldn't do that. Yeah, No, they could not do that. So, uh, But they promise like the exact Ooh. same low latency stuff of G-Sync on this panel. That they sure. would not release it otherwise. So they'll, they'll say it has a monitor OSD. So like when I first read this, yeah. when I first read this press release and wrote it up, I was thinking, oh, cool. They're using Android TV. So like Sony on their on their current flagship TVs and even a little lower than that, they use yeah. Android TV as the operating system. So you can like change all the picture settings and the inputs through Android TV, which is a really slick implementation. But there's none of that going going here. You have a separate shield remote and controller. And yeah. It uses, it uses HDMI C and CEC internally to switch the input when you wake up the shield, which is kind of nice. But so like these don't really seem like TV replacements. They seem like big monitors. Yeah, I was asking like how many inputs do you have. Uh, no on. Dolby Vision, so like you won't be able to play some Netflix HDR content because it's encoded in Dolby Vision. So nah. we'll see. Also at CES, Intel announced Optane 800p. They indeed they did. What is this? Uh, so remember that Optane memory thing that would cache a hard drive or an SSD? I might have heard of it. You know, and you'd, you'd plug it in and there was a software thing you'd install and just magically do this cache thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there were some people that were using those as like OS SSDs because it worked just like a regular NVMe thing. Even though it only went up to 32 gigs. Yeah, only went up to 32 gig, kind of painful. Well, imagine that product. Kind of really. Imagine that product, except with uh, not 16 and 32 gig, but 60 and 120 gig. Okay. Because it looks identical. Like, I even compared the layout in that picture compared to like this 32 gig part. Right. It's the same layout, the controller, Looks like it even, almost even has the same part number on it. Like it's literally looks like the same thing, just more space available, right? So it's still going to be a buy two PCI Express thing. It's probably going to perform more like the 32 gig version than the 16 gig version of the prior one. Because remember, there was a fall off in performance for the the 16 gig because it was only right. using one channel, whereas the 32 had two uh, two dies on it. Right. This still has just two packages on it, but those packages are going to have more dies in them. Got it. 
right? So you just, you know, now you're stacking up, the cross point dies, getting more available capacity, and, you know, it's not going to beat a 900p. It has half the available bandwidth in the first right. place. Right, it's by two instead of by four, first right. of all, right? Yeah. Um, there's a chance it might have better latency than a 900p because, remember, the Optane memory things had slightly better latency, mm. uh, slightly lower latency than 900p. Yeah, yeah. Um, the trade-off is there's, I think it's only like a two-channel controller in, in those, just those devices uh, in general, right. whereas the you know, the so, 900p had way more channels. You mentioned it in the, in the news post, but like, it's going to be a difficult thing to get past to have 60 to 120 gig capacities. It again. is. It right? is. That's, that's kind of where we were at. When SSDs first started, X twenty five M, it's eighty where, gig. It's where we were at when we first got <laughs> yeah, our no first kidding. NVMe SSDs. Right, X twenty five M had a higher capacity than this. What? It was an eighty gig. They yeah. sold a one sixty gig. I, I know it was uh, fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, but like the, <laughs> it the, existed. The quote unquote like original SSD that was good to buy had a higher capacity option. Yeah. than this. Uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, yes, but I mean, if you look at for like. Form factor is probably the big concern yeah. here, right, for them. But these are M.2s. I would see, like, crazy power user types. Like, I mean, heck, we were even doing RAID testing with four of the 32 gig parts. You but, say, heck, even we, like... We're like, not crazy Yeah, people. like, well, well, like yeah, we're slightly, we're you know, enthusiast kind of whatever. But, like, you can get a, uh, you know, four 120s in RAID. You could. So that's a 480. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? you could. We don't really think about pricing I mean, yet. We don't really think about when they're actually available, though, do we? No. They just said Q1, I think. Um, Q1. So we'll, we'll we'll have a review up of this, but it it is coming. 128 gig. Uh, you know, even 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 the Z370 boards that you could do two, right? You could do two in RAID. Yeah, I mean, there might be. I think there's a board or two that will do three. Okay, but the yeah. majority should be able to yeah, do the ma two majority of the newer full platforms. desktop boards. Yeah, so you're getting up to 240 gigs, and that's you know boot plus applications type of thing. You're in you're in the range, um, but yeah, it, it, it's a far step. We every time we go through like a storage progression, we regress in that capacity. I mean, yeah, that hasn't yeah. happened in quite a while. I mean, so it happened with SATA SSDs, and I feel, and it happened with M.2 SSDs too, right? Like uh. the first M.2 SSDs we were getting peaked at. Maybe 250 for the, at the most type yeah, of thing. Maybe. I think um, I think where Intel is stuck here on these is that I'm pretty sure that's just the only controller that they can use on an M.2 form factor because the power the time draw. Being. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, and I assume they probably fixed the power draw thing on this model because if they're really going to market it as something that's going to be like, oh, you can put this in your desktop, use it as your primary drive, right. and. Um, you know, even put it in mobile platforms, potentially, you, you have to, you know, the, the Optane memory parts didn't really even have, like, an idle state to them. They just always drew whatever power they drew. Like, their idle power was very high. It was, like, a few watts. Yep. Just continuous, like, vampire draw. So, presumably, they fixed that with these, but still, it mm -hmm. looks like the same controller, and that controller can only go so far. Maybe they can only physically connect it to two packages worth of die stacks. Like maybe they just that's, that's as far as that. They, maybe, maybe that's just as far as they controller. go w w with this, right? And then right. so they need a, they need a new controller to push M.2 Optane further. Agreed. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Ken, you got to see the Vive Pro. We both did. Uh, well, I'm just throwing it to you. So yeah, you know, hey, you, you went to the press conference. We did. did. We both got to demo it. Um, this is new, higher resolution, right? Seventy eight percent increase in pixels. Um. A move to OLED displays. Oh, okay. Okay, I didn't know that, actually. Yeah. So it goes from 2160 by 1200 to 2880 by 1600 mm -hmm. um, as a shared resolution. Uh, it's a little bit... First of all, I, like the, I didn't see any of the, black, the blue ones. We didn't see blue ones there, did no, we? we did. Did we? They're all blue. Oh, you're right. They're That's all, how they differentiate they have, The lighting, if it's in a dark room, they look It's black. difficult to tell. Yeah. I think these pictures make it look awesome, and I would get one almost just for that. Uh, but they have, like, better uh, headphones now, more sound-isolating headphones. Um, there's some ergonomic improvements in terms of just attaching it, like the um, um, the dial on the back is now used for, it's, yeah, this right here. It's like a it's like a welder's helmet thing. It is. And a, 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 a lot of other, like, the VR, that... MR headsets, like the, uh, the Acer... Um, Microsoft mixed reality mixed one. reality headset we have is like that, and it actually works better. The, the does the PSVR use that too? 
I think it's a similar type. I think it's mechanism. the same idea. Not not having to adjust two Velcro straps simultaneously on the side of your head yes. is pretty great. Big advantage there. Um, it's got two front-facing cameras now. Yeah, they they didn't say anything about that. They just <laughs> it, it has them, <laughs> right? Who knows? It could be for more like of a of a stereo depth thing with the chaperones. Yeah, they said it was supposed about, to. I've I've read some stuff that said it was supposed to improve the chaperone. The, the thing, HTC right? said nothing about them. I don't know, there's, there's been a lot of conjecture about what they could be used for, but HTC said reality, nothing in that first Finally, yeah. did they talk about like the resolution of the cameras or any frame nope, rates? They, they didn't talk the, about the cameras. Yeah, the um, I read somewhere, I read on the Vive page that the field of view was slightly bigger. It's from the sounds of it. Of of the of the cameras, you mean? No, or of the no, no, no. Screen the, inside. The screens inside. So not only do you have more resolution, but I believe you have a slightly. Well, it's not too much wider because then your no, pixel density doesn't. It, it's not. Change. It's not. But it's just slightly. It was like a twenty something percent, or it was like low number percent increase in your field of view, and then there the, was the resolution increase. They also announced in partnership with Intel the wireless adapter for sixty gigahertz Y gig. Um, how does that attach to your face or head, Ken? I don't the, know. It sticks on the top. It's a mouth guard. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> it, no, they, they, really, they, they stick it on the top. It looks like you've got one of those Japanese samurai helmets on. Suppository. Uh, ah. Oh. Huh. So fortunately, uh, <laughs> fortunately, the 60 uh, gigahertz stuff is like receiving there. So you're not trans. You're not trying to transmit an inch away from your skull. I mean, across a room. I, I mean, yeah, that's, you have that's to transmit. Got you have the to tra plugins. Well, yeah. transmit something. Back. What you're transmitting is not the super high power, like. Is it not? Line of is it not stuff. in the 60 gigahertz band? You don't no, think? no. What you're transmitting could it be no different than the what the controller. It's just basically your input. Yeah, yeah. And the controllers are just Bluetooth. Yeah, and the tracking doesn't require right. Bluetooth, so you're not actually transmitting anything from the headset. Well, no, you have the position, camera in position it. data, position, position of the yeah. yeah, which is no different than the position data of the controllers going sure. back to the. It would seem you know. weird for them to have another radio in there to do that, but maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, how, the, how heavy is the battery pack, and how long does it last? No details on so that. Didn't get to choose. It said didn't get to use it one. said something like, um, there was some adjective they used, but it was like. It, it implied enough hours of gameplay. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Yeah, it was like what I came away with was like you might be lucky with two hours from the way that they worded it. I was mm. like, okay, that probably means like a couple of hours. We'll just hook a USB battery pack up to this, and there you go. <laughs> Twenty thousand million. I, love I it. mean, you know, I love you, it. you're still not tripping over a cord. In that case, uh, yeah, you know, but then your head gets really tired. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You don't put the USB. <laughs> you don't put the power pack on your head. You put it just, in your back pocket. Even or if something? it had like a short cord, at least you're not dragging. Why well, about just have a damn VR backpack at that point? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, Ken and I both got to try this, and there is a a noticeable difference in the pixel density quality. Could you actually read like um, words? Yeah, and so stuff? like the demo where they had it like side by side, there was some text and stuff for you to look at, and you and it was definitely better, and and but both of us agreed that we we did like a racing sim and like a it's racing a set chair. Of course, so. Yeah, yeah, and because you were so focused on the racing and like the movement of everything else, it was hard for me to even to really tell that, that I was on a new headset. Yeah, right, and uh, it, of course they had us in. Eight thousand dollar fully pneumatic racing yeah. chairs that but were a, reacting to the game, so you weren't really paying that much attention. Josh would have loved it. But in a racing sim, you're not. I would have. You're actually not paying as much attention to like the movement of the headset specifically because you're more still. Like yes, yeah, you're, correct. You're you're panning back and forth a little bit, but like you're looking forward for the most part. I also did another thing. Um, what's a, I did a I did a walkthrough of a Ready Player One level, or, or oh, stage I wish I or something that. like that. Damn it. It was uh, what's his name's garage. Uh, what's what's the main whoever, character's name? I don't know his name, is. name is. Oh, but he was really into it before a second ago. I forgot the names. Uh, I read the, like the book came out like so freaking eight yeah, years ago or something. It looks really neat. Um, availability is the first half of the year. They're going to give first dibs to people who are current Vive owners. Like they're going to basically. It's just, it's, well, you only get the headset. It's not really first dibs. 
Well, you gonna, won't get the rest of the system. Right. So they're you only kinda... shipping the headsets. So <laughs> yeah, you have yeah. to have the other stuff, right? Because there's new there's new lighthouse system. Um, so, so it will work the with the old lighthouses later. and the base station 1.0 tracking and base station 2.0, which is the new stuff. Base station 2.0 sounds like it's not going to be ready until the summer time frame. So mm-hmm. they're going to sell you the headset if you already have base station 1.0 trackers. This quarter, I believe they said, no pricing or anything like that. Of course. They said pricing in a couple of weeks. The, the, the difference with the 2.0 trackers is that you're supposed to be able to put four of them in a room if you wanted to mm-hmm. for more space, mm-hmm. right? To cover a much larger cover area. Cover more space. So 10 meters by 10 meters is what four of them will cover. Yeah. And you're just running into, like, you're just too far away from the, the beam, yeah. like, for it to just be able to pick it out anymore if you try to go 10 meters away from one lighthouse. Sure. Right? Um, and then the other difference is there's only one rotor in in the Rev 2 oh, really? lighthouses. Yeah, it does the... The two beams actually are like crisscrossing. Mm. They they they're like on a forty five degree Instead angle. Of 90s. Yeah, and it's able to just you know do it just some extra math to figure out. Got it. You know where it was. Looks in cool. Space. Also, I was wrong. The original Vive used OLED. So. Oh, it did. Okay. All right. I couldn't remember. Uh, quickly, I'll touch on this. HP announced the Intel based version of the NVX2 detachable. Uh, we had already seen uh, at the Maui event that Qualcomm had the NVX2 version using their part. Now there's an Intel version. Um, they look very similar. They have different stand designs. Yeah, which is weird, right? It seems really dumb. I don't know why no, they would do yeah. that. Unless they're trying to like do their own internal A B testing of which one people hate the most. Maybe. Um, yeah, but then you add another variable and now you're. Yeah, that's true. Uh, this is going to be, you know, better performance, but lower battery life, less connect, less connectivity um, than the Qualcomm version. Well, to be fair, this does have a built-in modem still. Uh, sorry, by connectivity, I meant uh, like the always-on, always-connected yeah. uh, stuff, right? Where you just turn connected it on and it's always on. There stuff. you go. Yeah, that's better. Um, they, still claim, they claim 15 hours of battery life. HP on this device claims 20 hours on the Qualcomm hardware. Um, not quite the 2X claim that Qualcomm makes, made itself uh, at the tech day. So we'll have to see how all that pans out with uh, actual hardware. Um, but, you know, in terms of physical design, they're basically identical except for the keyboard and kickstand and whatnot. So we'll see more on that soon as well and then also in terms of like slick looking machines this acer redesigned swift 7 the world's thinnest laptop ken and i got to see this at an intel event as well it's really thin yeah that looks really it's like it's comically thin yeah it's almost like this is fake type of thing right um it still feels well built though it doesn't feel super flimsy like obviously the screen feels flimsy and uh you can only make that so structural right exactly but it but it's better than i expected honestly i was impressed on with the keyboard like the keyboard didn't feel like a mushy piece of crap with no travel it felt like a pretty standard chiclet keyboard on laptop which is amazing one thing I forgot to mention on that Dell XPS 15 2 in 1, it uses magnetic levitation keys for the keyboard. What's that even mean? It, it's That's, using magnets to it's push not, it's up. It's not springs. It's yeah, it's using magnets as the force to push the keys back up. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. Uh, maglev so usually So you really in, want to put a spinning rust drive. No, in no, there, well, I mean, don't you? All SSDs. Maglev usually implies that it's act like an active electromagnet, and it is those, not. those are just it is magnets. Not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> these are just magnets. But it is magnetic levitation. Why'd my battery die so quickly? Well, I was powering like a hundred and something keys, you know, and it's magnetic levitation. It's Did just you like it stick it to the fridge. Uh, maybe I'll try that first. I'll just push it against. So how did they? Go. Did you type? I did. It it felt different than the other XPS keyboards, but it felt okay. Okay. Right, like it felt fine, and they they talked fairly extensively with me about. Um, the research they had done into it, the the, the reliability they had done uh, on I just wonder why it, it was a- 12.5 million keystrokes. Well, sure, what's going to wear out? It's just a magnet. Like I don't know, the switch underneath it or something? I don't oh, know. I guess. Did they say, that, like, they have a reason? Did they say, like, the... It was th- for thinness. Okay. Right? Like, and they were trying to get the machine as thin as they could while getting as much battery, and this is the Kaby Lake G system, so mm-hmm. they were trying, just, just for thinness. Uh, anyway, the Swift 7, also much, it's also significantly thinner than that. Uh, but it is a what what processor is it's in this? a it's a well, it's a sorry a Core M a Y okay. skew. 
the i7 7y75. So essentially what Intel, the guy from Intel was saying, who was showing us these two machines, the HP and the Acer, is that they took the same sort of core miniaturization technology that allowed them to put the core i7 Y series and uh, the Intel LTE modem into a tablet, and Acer sort of applied the same thing to a notebook with more battery. And, like they, they kind of took that Got so it. they could make a super thin base, and then they could like shingle battery in there and get some key travel still and make a traditional notebook type design. And this does have an Intel LTE modem yes. in it as well. Yes. So part of that connected ecosystem. It's like 1600 bucks. So, you know. It doesn't have amazing battery life because no. there's not any room for battery, worth noting. But, you know. Moving on. About the same as a NUC. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, about the same battery life. <laughs> uh, Acer uh, released the Nitro 5 gaming laptop powered by Ryzen Mobile. Um, this is it's a it's a larger machine, 15.6, 1080p. Uh, this basically is the second. Is this the APU base or is this no? Okay, this well is, it's both. It's oh okay. It's got both. it's got like a 2500U and a RX 560 in it because there's no uh, current not APU option for Ryzen on notebooks. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. they had to use that. I imagine they'll be using the integrated GPU and the 2500U for some power saving stuff instead of using the 560 all the time. You'd hope, hope so. Interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. But it's it's good to see more Polaris based notebook options. There are a couple out there right now, but like having yeah. like Polaris seems to do pretty well in a notebook. Oh, I don't think I mentioned the AMD side, but AMD did confirm they were going to do a Vega mobile GPU, but they gave no time frame on it. So there That's you go. That's funny because they, they already have a Vega mobile GPU. Except Selling it to it's Intel. Intel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I think in their line, it's going to be higher performance than that. The, 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 so quote, the quote someone got out of Scott was that, well, you could put a Vega 10 in a, G, in a notebook. It was about the extent of the quote. Yeah, so <laughs> you could do that thing. <laughs> uh, Gigabyte was the only company I think that showed off X four seventy motherboard. Um, so there it is. It's the Aorus X four seventy gaming seven Wi Fi. So that's the next generation of AMD motherboards. Okay, what do you guys think? It looks like a motherboard. Looks like a motherboard. Looks nice. Yeah, it's got RGBs. Of course it does. What are you They're, nuts? They didn't. Here's the they Thunderbolt. Didn't, <laughs> no Please fad. tell me this RGB motherboard Not thing is a fad. Not very many USB ports. Do you think it's a fad? I mean, I guess there's a four, no, six, but... eight. There's eight there. No, I don't think eh. RGBs are a fad. They're you don't think RGB forever. motherboards are a fad? You can always turn RGBs off, man. I know. I'm sorry. There's ten there. Uh oh, you're right. You're right. The red and the black. Yep. Type C. Yeah. They didn't have a whole lot to say about. What's new on this motherboard? It's mostly just a revised design with a new chipset. It's because they're not supposed to be showing it. Well, but <laughs> probably. I I think they would have told us. Let's let's put it that. Oh, I see. Got so it. I, I mean, guess it plays a lot nicer with memory. Yeah. It, th th that was kind of the point I was going to make. Is for nothing else, at least they have a chance with the new chipset to produce new motherboards that they might not have produced Correct. otherwise. So things like Jeremy mentioned with memory speeds, like. They might put an external clock generator on these new boards where they didn't before to get higher memory clocks or working with AMD to make sure that they have the right AGISA code to get higher memory speeds and stuff like that. Right. I think these will still be interesting boards even if the X470 chipset doesn't necessarily offer a whole lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. We'll know more in April. Uh, speaking of crazy crap, how about this? <laughs> Asus announces a bezel-free kit from the ROG brand. This is basically some pieces of plastic lenses. Apologies Would you for say they're uh, prism shaped. Apologies for not showing a photo yeah. of this because it was impossible to photograph properly. Whatever. Clearly, they did it. That's not uh, photoshopped. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea <laughs> is where you have your three monitors coming together, those two seams that are created in your NVIDIA surround or Affinity configuration. <clears throat> what if you could use prisms? Fresno lenses. Sure. Prism-shaped Fresno yeah. lenses. Well, I don't they're Fresnos because they were... They are. They had the ridges in them. Okay. To essentially hide the bezel. 
right? And they do that. There's there is some distortion that occurs, right? Because it's would be impossible to do otherwise. That would be freaking magic. Yeah. Um, and it it worked better than I thought it when did. I saw the announcement. Right? It did. It worked well. Um. You know, it, it doesn't only work with ASUS monitors. It can work with anything that has a thin bezel, although there are, it there, like it would, there are it size would, restrictions, right? Yeah. Like, you know, the height and width and all yeah. that stuff. It looks like it would fit best on those specific It also panels. doesn't really look like it's flexible in terms of the angle. No. Right? No, like no, no, the no. monitors have was, to be at, at this specific angle. It has yeah. to be at 130 degrees. And they said they did a lot of user testing to determine what angle people actually wanted these at since yeah. you couldn't change it and they came up with 130. Yeah. I mean you can't sure. really make those work that way. You and can't have make it work at multiple angles. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise you have to redo the the, the, lens. the lens. Yeah. Yeah. Um I I don't know what else to say. What do they say like the, the only thing that I the only thing that I wished could have been different about them is that just like how the bezels would kind of bug me, what bugs me a little bit more is that you'd get so if you had a diagonal line running across that you know, transition, yep. right? Mm -hmm. It would change angle as it was going through the lens. Mm -hmm. It has to, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're trying to, you know, so it, it just would have been cooler to me if there was some way through NVIDIA driver or something, not just do the bezel correction thing, but also do a thing where it's intentionally uh, showing distorting you. Distorting it at the screen. It's distorting it at that yeah. edge where the lens would be over in such a way that what you're seeing across the lens is it's you know completely filling it in properly. In other words, diagonal line would be a diagonal line going straight through. That seems like an awful lot of work for because because what was it the is. so the, so they had a they had a racing game running, and Josh would appreciate this the best, right? Actually, like was, no, he wouldn't because it was an awful demo. That game well, did not support that sort of aspect ratio in the least. Oh. There was that, but the <laughs> fact was, was like so. In, in any kind of racing game on a set of screens like that, you would have the road, like the lines from the you know right and left edges of the road, yeah. cutting through those, mm -hmm. and they would always look weird, mm -hmm. right? Whereas even if you just didn't have the prisms, you'd have bezels in the way, sure, but at least the lines would track straight. You know what I mean? But yeah, I mean, your brain edits the bezels out pretty quickly. When you get into a game, you just don't yeah. see them anymore. Uh, unless you know you've got something on a, a slightly bad angle, in which case it stares glares at you until you fix it. Right. And, <laughs> so and at least... with these, that there's just that little bit that's going to be wrong, and it's going to be hard to get the brain to just ignore it because it's going to be saying, was, "No, there's something weird." That's that's what was popping out to me. It might not affect everybody that way, but that's what was popping out to me. I was like, "Oh, every time there was a line that would cut across it, it just was like popping out." At least in my it would be my interesting perception. to see if Nvidia would do something like that. It wouldn't be difficult. Just, I mean, they would never do that because they don't like. Who cares? Like, when's it's, the last it's a time you heard nice Nvidia mention surround? Yeah, it's a very as nice a technology. True. Yeah, I mean, iFinity has been mentioned more than that, but it's still not yeah. like, on the tip of people's tongues. Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting idea. I, I'll probably get a set in to try it out with some Types monitors. Some monitors. <laughs> we kind of yeah, we need like. Yeah, I mean, I can get monitors. It's not the problem. It's I, I just I don't know. I, I think it'd be curious now. Also, when you are done gaming, you have to take them off. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> if you're going to do normal computing, you know. It seemed to come on and off pretty they easy. Did. They did. They were easy to install and take off. So Yeah, because any window you had near the, you know, half inch edge left or right of the screen would be stretched. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds awesome. Not really. That's how uh, I like my Excel. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the next, uh, the other thing Asus had that I thought was really interesting was they announced the uh, Lyra Voice, which is a you know a new brand of of connected devices. It's a multi-feature device. It's an 802.11ac mesh Wi-Fi hub as well as voice assisted uh, or voice assistant enabled stereo speaker. I mean, sure, they make routers. So I, I just like the idea of this of of my devices. Extending my network and making it yeah. better as opposed to not. It's already as opposed a, to just being you, there. It's already an internet dummy. connected thing that you're plugging in somewhere somewhere else in your house anyway. Yeah. You might as well. So yeah. as long as you can have this mesh system expanding, yeah. then yeah. why wouldn't you want to do it, right? So uh, it works with the Asus existing Lyra mesh networking system. Uh, it's tri-band AC2200 class stuff uh, radio there. It integrates Amazon Alexa, which is which is great. Uh, oops, she sorry, she's going to talk to me now. Oh, no, she didn't. Um, 
And then uh, they also, uh, the, uh, the Asus Lyra Trio is a dual band multi-hub mesh system. It looks like that. That looks, if, if you remember way back in the day, Asus released networking, wireless networking gear that looked like that except black. It was yep. a USB adapter for like 802.11n. Yeah. yeah. It's really good. Like that antenna design was and actually the, I think they good. said they said that those will also come in black if you want them. I don't remember them saying no, that. No, they did. I, I, did I, they? I asked oh, yeah, them. They did. Yeah. They just didn't have, they weren't showing them, but. You'd be able to get them. Uh, and then they also announced the RTAX88U, which is an 802.11ax router uh, with a maximum throughput of 6,000 megabits, otherwise known as 6 gigabits, uh, 8 gigabit LAN ports for wired connections, and obviously using MU MIMO. And that's a standard that's uh, not that. like final, final yet. Yeah. Right? And when I asked, like, hey, are you sure you can be able to support 802.11ax when it's done? It was dismissed as, yeah, no, everything, all the chip guys are done. We're all finished with this. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I have no way to, to back it. But it's always a risk if you buy a router like this before yeah. it's things all, are final, final, It's supposedly final. all radio firmware at this point. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, and real quickly, since we're running late, finally, uh, Lenovo had a new ThinkPad X1 lineup. It had 8th gen, GP, 8th, 8th gen CPUs, uh, but also HDR displays involved in this, which I think is maybe the most interesting thing. The X1 Carbon... Uh, and is it the Yoga have it too? Yeah. They both have 2560 by 1440 IPS Dolby Vision HDR screens. This is basically the replacement of the OLED. It is. Um, in this line. Um, very expensive devices. The X1 Yoga starts at 1889. Yeah. That's uh, around. The Yoga starts at 1709. That's around what the OLED was starting at. Was it? Okay. When I asked them about the OLED, they were kind of cagey about it, and they said basically it was a power issue. For yeah, them. power and I think screen availability. They said there's only one guy making them, and also they use they use more power. So they went well, they back were, with the were, HDR. I think they were putting a slightly larger battery in the OLED models. They were, yeah, just to kind of help make up that. that. The HDR screens looked really good. Yeah, I don't think they looked as good to me initially as the OLED screens looked to me initially. Mm -hmm. I didn't have they didn't have them side by side. They weren't going to do that right. right if there was some kind of deficit. Um, but I think there's probably more application for a Dolby Vision HDR screen in the long run. Um, and if I didn't they, think to ask if it would also support HDR10, I would assume because that's just a free software-based thing. Like, whereas oh, Dolby yeah. Vision requires an, an a chip many bits? to do. Uh, I didn't ask. I don't think I asked. Uh, hmm. They also mentioned what else did they say? Be moving away from OLED to this allowed them to do a glass-free touchscreen. Glass free, like it was just plastic. It was like matte finish, like like this screen essentially, oh. without any performance degradation in the touch interface or something like that. Okay, because um, I guess they, they couldn't do a matte finish of the OLED, right? But now they can of this. Now you suffer some of your image quality, like that, your that color might, that might be why your it wasn't popping as much to you. That's probably yeah, because I, I I think they only I think the only one I saw was the matte version. Yeah, but I think they will offer it in both. So in other words, they can make the screen a little bit thinner. Yep. On the top and and you know. I was seeing the same effect. The I same saw time. I saw a few different HDR displays at CES this time that were on matte finish displays. Yeah. And the contrast was noticeably reduced. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Especially so, if you have uh, that uh, ASUS uh, external yeah. monitor, yeah. for example. Did the same yeah. Thing. But. External it, monitor. In that monitor. Portable monitor. In that portable <laughs> monitor's defense, <laughs> like there was a pretty bright light. It was like a bad place to demo right down that. on it. Yeah, and it, you have a mess finished screen. Because I looked at like... it, I looked at it, and I remember telling him, my buddy there, I said, "Are you sure this is HDR?" It, yeah, it, the, the blacks like, were not black. Is this like a prototype that's not actually HDR? And it's like, no, it's the right one. It's, and, okay, well, it's just it's in a bad spot for this. But yeah, he's gonna email me and yell at me now. But <sighs> sorry, such is life. Uh, and then the Lenovo Mirage VR camera and untethered motion tracking Daydream headset. Um, the so the 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 headset is it's freestanding. You don't slot a phone into it. This is powered by Qualcomm. Um, it's part of the Daydream, the Google Daydream ecosystem. Um, they kind of pre-announced this at I/O. I think that Lenovo that, and okay. Google were yeah. working together. Yep. Uh, Snapdragon 835, four gigs of memory, uh, micro SD expansion up to 256 gigs. There, 2560 by 1440 display, 110 degree field of view, 1.42 pounds total. Uh, they claim up to seven hours of use per charge, although Lenovo notes that this number may vary based on the complexity <laughs> of the Daydream content. As an aside, I saw today that uh, Res Infinite is on 
the Google Play oh, Store now as a Daydream app, which I think would be like a really cool piece of content. We'll have I to think try to we dig have up that uh, stuff. Dig we, up a headset. I've got. The, I think we still have the Daydream and that Note Eight still sitting there. So, I think that works with that, right? I know we have the Daydream headset from the Pixel XL. I just don't know what phones well, we it'll can support put yeah. in there. They also announced the Mirage camera. Uh, which is a compact VR capture device that records 180 degrees of video uh, through two 13 megapixel fisheye lenses. And then uh, it integrates with Google Photos and YouTube for easy sharing and playback, obviously, in that device or anything that supports uh, yeah. VR playback. You can live stream from this. I assume oh. connected to like your phone as a hotspot, but right. you, you, can, you can live stream to YouTube in VR 180. Uh, they changed their pricing segment uh, to under three hundred dollars for the camera and under four hundred dollars for the Mirage Solo, which is the uh, the Daydream headset itself. So I'm curious to get my hands on that because I think this will be. I don't know if they say anything about availability. Oh, ships in the second quarter. Okay, so not immediately available. I was trying to think if there was another, if there is an immediately shipping, freestanding headset as opposed to one that's slotted. I don't think there is. Not a daydream one. Yeah, so this might be, have, this might be one of the first. You have Oculus Go and the Vive Focus, but I don't think they're Vive Focus yet. is no longer a daydream product, and Oculus uh, Go isn't, obviously. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's get into our hardware picks of the week. We'll run through these quick as well. Uh, mine is uh, I'm cheating, and I'm picking literally nothing uh, <laughs> because – I wanted to use this time slot to talk about graphics cards. Oh, no. What? Uh, graphics card pricing and how it so sucks again. Angry. So it's an anti-pick. Uh, it's an anti-pick. Don't buy video cards. Uh, actually, I will give a shout-out to uh, Jason Evangelo, who wrote a story uh -huh. on Forbes about... He, was, he, he's, he basically said, I was going to write a story about here's the gaming PC you should build, and everything was so expensive. He started looking into OEM PCs. Oh, yeah. That have, you know, 1070s, 1080s in them, 16 gigs of RAM. And these are components that they've bought a while ago that they have bulk purchasing. Yeah, but now people are going to buy those just to rip the GPUs out of them. Well, it seems like a less likely venture because now uh -huh, you have to I invest so. $1,600, $1,800 in a system. Yeah. But if you're going to spend something like that anyway, you know, if you can effectively get your GPU for two or $300 less yeah. because of it, yeah. it might work out that you're getting the same components. Um, you know, maybe not in the case you want, or maybe not the specific vendor of motherboards you want, or whatever. But you can actually buy a system. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen plenty of people tweeting at me and emailing me, talking about like, what when, when's this going to die? When when's this going to fix? Uh, because they're just basically waiting to build systems until they can get a GPU, and they just can't do it. True. Um, I don't really have anything else to say other than that, other than it sucks. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin pricing going way down. I tweeted out earlier yeah, that, keep, like... Keep an eye on it because there was a huge dip today. Huge. And yesterday. And and right. I tweeted and out that, like, hey, Bitcoin prices went down, so maybe we'll finally get GPUs yeah. for sale. But it takes and some time. And I guess some smart-ass people on Twitter are like, oh, GPUs don't even mind Bitcoin anymore, idiot. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Jesus. I, I, yeah, but no, if you look I, at every other crypto market, it. it was also down. But every, other, every mining person ends up converting that back into Bitcoin. If you're doing it for financial gains, you convert it back to Bitcoin and sell All it. All the altcoins uh, track. track it to a larger degree. than if Bitcoin drops like 15%, a lot of the altcoins will go down like 20%. Yeah. So, so. Uh, yes, I clearly understand that you can't use GPUs to mine Bitcoin. However, the Bitcoin value it affects moves everybody. Everything. Damn it, it moves everything. Yeah. So uh, you know, I don't think one day of a giant dip in Bitcoin mining is going to change anything. But if it happens to be for a week, yeah. you may start to see people sell it off as they're now making you know thirty, forty, fifty percent less than they were making before on their mining operations. And so, keep an eye out for something like that. There might be some good news there. Um, but I have no good news from like AMD or Nvidia. Right. I've been keeping an eye on it recently, and if you go to like now on stock and you subscribe to Newegg and Amazon notifications, like once a day, some of these GPUs will be posted. It might not be from the maker you want, and they're fairly close to MSRP. Like you can get a 1070 Ti for like like 540, which is which is pretty. That's like a hundred dollars over, mm. isn't it? Uh, no, this supposed no. to be a 449 product. Bucks. It's like 479 or something. And like these, are, these are okay. aftermarket okay. cards, so they might be a little bit more. So if you just like keep an eye on that, there will be short periods of time where you can grab them. I saw yesterday Jacob tweeted right before they posted products on the EVGA store. So keep an eye on stuff like that. Oh, it's right. Not, like, hey, it's not impossible to get a GPU. Yeah. You just have to be ready to jump on 
whatever card you can get for the given GPU you if want. If you're willing to spend, so on GeForce.com, everything's out of stock except <laughs> the Star Wars Edition Titan XP for 1138. Is that still the original price? It's, uh, it's actually lower. The original price was twelve ninety nine. They lowered it to eleven thirty eight. Uh, eleven thirty eight being THX one one three eight George Lucas's <laughs> first movie. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, the name of one of the bounty hunter droids in the movie. So, um, what do you got miners buying those instead of the? Uh... So, actually, what the story, <laughs> what the message I saw earlier was somebody had a Vegas sixty four. They sold it for twelve hundred dollars and bought one of these instead, which is going to be a significantly better performance. That's true. You know. Than that in terms of for gaming, but um, eleven, uh, you know, the, saying hey, you can buy a video card, you just at retail price, you have to spend eleven hundred dollars is still kind of a shitty thing to have to deal with. So uh, I apologize, although I can do nothing about it. Moving on, who's uh, Jeremy? What do you got? Uh, well, if anyone's played Bridge Constructor, uh, which is just an amusing and not very expensive game, adding Glados to it really works. Uh, it is bloody hilarious. A uh, PR person sent me a code for the game like back in November-ish, and I just never got around to it until I got back from Christmas break. Installed it. It's uh, 10 or 12 bucks, depending on where you're buying it from. Did it originally not six... have GLaDOS in it? Not the same way. Oh, okay. Mm. This, is, this is very portal. Uh, there's 60 levels on it, and like I say, it's about 10 or 12 bucks, so it's it's decent. And being awful to people is quite rewarding, <laughs> as, as you can see there. You you get some very amusing insults. So yeah, if you're bored, and you want a little bit of mindless fun, or just to amusingly torture people, it it's worth the 10, 12 bucks. Huh. Interesting, very cool. And like you just play a, a level or two, and then go off and do something else. You don't need to worry about it at all. It's kind of nice. Cool. Uh, Josh. Any new Patreons? Uh, uh, since I last mentioned, I will yeah. say no. Oh, well, I thought I saw one go up anyway. Um, they lied, they <clears> lied to real you. hardware. Real hardware. <laughs> <laughs> if you've never cooked in an iron skillet... You need to learn because they're so damn handy. They're very useful. They cook really good things. Mm -hmm. Grilling steaks in it and finishing them with butter in a blazing hot iron skillet is well, fantastic. Make sure, make sure you only... season it first before What's you... What does pre-seasoned pre mean? pre-season. Oh, it's pre-season. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, Ron Jeremy is uh, at the factory pre-seasoning yeah. your... Oh, pans. I see. All right. Yeah. What no, is that? What but, is that uh, supposed to mean? You, you have to like, bucks. you have to like, basically cook like oil into the iron if you get it. Yeah, yeah. You if know, you yeah. let and soap don't, touch, don't it. put it in the dishwasher. Yeah, don't don't do don't, that. Don't don't use soap. This is not a is dishwasher. Your, how do you thing. clean it? Just in the sink. You just you wipe salt? it out. You yeah. salt. Oh, okay. If there's something nasty, a bit of water, boil it up, wipe it out. So no yeah, soap. Fan. Okay. Fantastic no cooking soap. utensils. It, it'll start to rust used. on you. Like okay. you don't want to strip the oil on right. it. Yeah. Is the yeah. does, does Ron there's Jeremy's no protection have to on the handle? What again? if my hand gets hot? You That's could buy. Why they make little uh, quilted <laughs> gloves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What if I forget and I grab it? Can I blame um, you? You sure could. I uh, end up with. Uh, listen, but you can blame me all you want. <laughs> Sixteen dollars for a pretty yeah decent iron skillet. The reason Ooh, I have the remnants of a burn on my hand is because what the hell? I grabbed a stainless steel pan that had been in the oven with just just the edge was past my insulation and I burned the uh, that'll learn ya. With the hand. Can I get the one with the buffalo nickel? Sure. Why do I want this? So you can make pancakes. Yeah, you're <laughs> soon, man. Well, that looks like it'd be a huge pan. Actually, that clean. would be no, the no, worst. That would be the worst. Is, it's on the bottom of the skillet, oh. uh, and it's just it's uh, it's more of a see. It's also got the chrome. No, I don't know. It doesn't have. It's just it's know, just that, the buffalo. That, I mean, I think, wouldn't that wouldn't that make it less like? Wouldn't the heat be less? Yeah. Iron's pretty yeah, good. At yes, a it conducts less, it really well. Anyway. It does not gonna, mm. Yeah. All right, I want the And if you use it for home defense, you'll know which person it was you hit. 12 inch Boy Scout model. Whoa, easy guys. 15 inch. Braggy much? <laughs> it's for making little cornbreads. Mm. All right. That's an odd hardware pick, but I'll, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. Uh, finally, Alan. So I needed some uh, longer HDMI cables that would actually uh, transmit 4K60. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I got lucky because my distance I was trying to use was 15 feet in the first place. But the cables I had, which were like, you know, supposedly really highly graded cables that could do 4K60, supposedly, uh, wouldn't. So I was looking around. I stumbled upon some uh, Red Mirror cables. 15-foot version was significantly cheaper than normal on Amazon. It's not prime, but they're 11 bucks for a 15-foot Red Mirror HDMI cable, which is pretty cheap. It's almost like regular copper cable pricing for a 15-foot cable. Um... As comparison, the 25-foot cable is, like, $32. Got it. So, and that's where they start. Like, you know, they go all the way up to, like, a 60-foot for, like, 45 bucks. Yeah. yeah. So, for people that don't know, Red Mirror is a technology where there's kind of, there's an active IC in both ends of the dongle, and it's, it's using power from the HDMI connection to yeah. transmit to, to amplify the the signal, so right. you can use very very thin gauge cable, like way thinner than a normal HDMI cable, and go yep. longer distances. It's, it's translating. It's actually translating the HDMI signal into a like a different type of signal. Yeah. Even, mm -hmm. That's able to you know transit over that um, you know more finer gauge cable. So yeah, that's another bonus of them. That even though the ends are a little bit thicker, uh, the cable itself is. Yeah really thin unlike our traditional 25 foot hdmi cables we have in here in the studio that are like a half inch in diameter yeah, like you could tow a car with them you could actually have, have thin cables <laughs> that go like 25 this. 50 feet but i do they use them to tow cars yeah yeah exactly all right uh, uh no it doesn't add latency i was gonna ask that too it doesn't no the, I, I mean you wouldn't be able to tell it's, it really is if it going did. to add latency it, okay it's not, so, not a, measurable like, but it's not going to be a huge amount yeah because it's not, it's not like that that end is going to buffer a 4K frame in it. Right. It's literally passing the signal through as it's coming it's in. Through. It's not, yeah. Yeah. All right. It's only uh, gets a half a mile in Ethernet cable or anything. Who would do such? Yeah. It adds latency because it's imagine. speed of light and you're adding feet. The, so, um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I'll end on this. The uh, Hawaii emergency management stuff that happened, whatever. I just saw this story that went up today. Apparently there was press in there detailing like hey yeah. show me what happened whatever and then there was a picture of a guy in front of one of the computers and there's a password on a post-it note stuck to the monitor <sighs> and the thing of it's course like, oh my god this is only it's getting worse i did see another a different tweet that was like this is what the screen looks like oh yeah we saw that uh, of the For choices the pop -up ad? and it was like no not that one the, the actual only, one the only difference was that the word drill was at the beginning of the same exact yeah. phrase yeah Yes. So it was. There's a lot of bad you know, user interface stuff. In that's that regard, really bad. But, uh, and there probably wasn't even like, yeah. a, or you're sure. It was probably bet, just like, yeah. click. And that's it just what Kim goes. and I were talking about the other day. It was like, <laughs> there should be like a big bread thing. Like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, are you really sure? Uh, but alas. Nope. That was, that was probably pretty awful. Uh, all right, everybody. That's going to be it for the episode this week. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back next week with another one. Uh, Wednesday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific at pcpro.com slash live. Uh, we'll probably have YouTube back up and running by then. I don't know. Um, pcpro.com slash podcast. Go there. You can find uh, the ways to download the episode, uh, subscribe, get the show notes, all the stories we've talked about. If you want to click through and, and read, them, read them along read along with them as we discuss them, that type of thing. Uh, all that's available at pcpro.com slash podcast. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Bye.